Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the first episode of uh, Voice TV uh, from the platform uh, DM Voice that we launched. Uh, and uh, uh, DM Voice is the place where uh, arts uh, uh, meet politics, and this will be the place where we will have uh, lots of guests uh, that are at the same time artists and activists in a way and that have to say something uh, about the current uh, uh, political uh, and social uh, situation in the world and uh, artists that of course uh, in a way uh, have socially engaged uh, works uh, and it is a great pleasure to uh, have with us tonight uh, Milan Markovic uh, Ramshak uh, a great playwright, uh, screenwriter, dramaturg, performer from Belgrade uh, that is uh, currently based in Ljubljana. He lives there. Uh, his uh, stage, uh, his, his plays have been staged in lots of countries and translated into uh, many languages. Uh, he also uh, received uh, numerous awards. Uh, and so, hi Milan. Hello, Maya. Uh, thank you for this generous uh, introduction. Uh, it's it was very to... serious. Uh, Milan is actually also uh, one of my dearest uh, friends and colleagues, but I, I tried to uh, get it serious uh, at first. Hey. Okay. Hi, Milan. Uh, well, uh, I did a little uh, subversion when uh, I put uh, your name on the poster. It was Milan Markovic Matisse. Uh, but uh, now we see a different name, uh, Milan Markovic Ramšak. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your changing names? Because uh, they're actually last names of your wives, your first wife and your second wife. Both of them are Nina. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't mind you uh, putting these two names because it's a bit hard to keep up with my name changing. I think I have five different passports in the last couple of years uh, because uh, um, yeah I, when I got married the first time I took also my wife's surname so I was Markovic Matis now I got married again and uh, now I am Milan Ramšak Markovic so it's um, yeah it's uh, yeah also there was a, a problem with uh, how do you say this uh, the way you transcribe in Serbian Matis because it's a Swedish surname, so it's with two T's and an H, and it was a bit hard to, uh, how do you say, in Serbia we use Kyrillic, so all my doc documents were transcribed in Serbian, so they also made a passport for me like this, so I had to change the passport again and so on and so on. But it is uncommon, uh, well, uh, in our country it's uncommon to uh, take your wife, uh, wife's uh, last name because uh, it's maybe common in other countries. Is it like uh, your little uh, maybe uh, battle against the patriarchy? Uh, you also did, uh, during your first wedding, uh, it was a very interesting uh, project, it was called the Performing Wedding and you actually uh, married your first wife and it was also a performance. Uh, I, I, I've been to your first wedding and to this performance and for me it was a very interesting experience because all of us knew that it was at the same time a wedding and a performance and but uh, actually the wedding register didn't know that uh, and uh, well the officials didn't know that. Uh, so, uh, how do you treat this performance? Is it like, was it a wedding? Was it a performance? What was it? And uh, is this, uh, in a way, uh, your battle against patriarchy, in a, in a way? I don't know if I would call it a battle, but uh, it, it, why was it? I mean, it's in my CV, this performance I put regularly in my CV because I see it as one of the, like, one of the performances I did because for my first marriage, uh, it was neither my, me or, or my partner didn't believe in marriage, didn't want to get married, but uh, she lived in Serbia for, for four years and then we decided to move to Sweden. So the only way for me to move to Sweden was to get married. And this was a fake marriage made out of love. So 
it was a fake marriage and we decided to somehow if it's already fake if it's something that is being performed we can uh, then literally perform it and we were lucky enough um, to get the opportunity to do it on one festival in Novi Sad so we uh, invited the, the the city clerk to come to this space where the, the this conference was taking place and we performed the wedding there and uh, we were announced as a guest performance so neither the i mean some of you knew of course but most of the per participants didn't know that this is going to happen neither did the city clerk know that this is going to happen like this and nobody really knew if it was fake or real and i really love it for this i think this was um my favorite kind of thing you know because uh, it's um, it's telling you something about the for me in my opinion it's telling you something about the how to say the nature of these kind of things no yes and yeah. uh, so do you think that uh, when we talk we talk a lot of course uh, nowadays and also lots of years ago we talk a lot about uh, the death of uh, capitalism and in a way we uh, try to imagine a world without capitalism. Uh, do you think that it is possible without the end of patriarchy? Yeah, but this, I mean, somehow I think that, uh, I mean, patriarchy is of course older than capitalism, but it got into this, uh, uh, how do you say, the, in this phase than it is today with the birth of, uh, of uh, bourgeois civilization i don't know how to say it and it, it was normalized in a way that it hasn't been before i have a feeling but i think it's very hard to think about that of capitalism because the way things are happening now it feels like uh like the, it's much more possible like it's so much harder of course as it, it's been said so much so many times before to imagine the end of world and the end of capitalism and it feels like especially with climate changes and all all the uh, climate change and all the how do you say crisis that we are going through that uh, this is not going to go any other way so yeah i think uh, a lot of us are fantasizing and have been fantasizing about the end of capitalism and it makes us feel good in a way and it makes us feel that uh, how to say how to say that uh, that uh, you know, starting from the already from the begin from the beginning of the last century, it felt like the capitalism is in crisis and it's going to eat itself in a way. But uh, the only thing that happened is it ate a lot of people and the environment. You know, it somehow didn't burn through. So I'm I'm a little bit cu uh, su suspicious towards easy solutions. You know, I don't like to I like to feel good about very concrete things. Uh, well, uh, when I called you um, uh, a month ago to be uh, the guest uh, at my show, I actually asked you if uh, you would like uh, for us to talk about this project we did together. Now it's almost, I think, 10 years from then. It was in a project we did in 2012 uh, called They Live in Search of Tech Zero. Uh, so I will just give a, a brief introduction so that people know what we're talking about. So Milan and I... Uh, uh, did a project in 2012 uh, when we became members of uh, seven leading uh, political parties in Serbia. Uh, our idea was actually uh, just to take the membership cards uh, and uh, bring our CVs to all these political parties, as at that time we were unemployed artists, uh, which we are still now. I think Milan is still unemployed, if I'm not. <laughs> are you? I'm unemployed. I mean, I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, I work from from yeah, project from to project. Project to project. Yes. And so our our idea was to uh, take our CVs to all the parties and to uh, tell them uh, that we want to be in a way engaged in uh, cultural councils and in the cultural uh, policies of their parties. So uh, it happened that uh, most of the parties uh, received us uh, very well and they um, actually called us a couple of days later to ask us to become members of cultural councils. So for three months, uh, the two of us were going to from meeting to meeting, uh, from one party to the other. Of course, the, the other parties didn't know that we were enrolled in all seven of them. 
And we were, uh, during these three months while this project was uh, happening, uh, we were uh, recording uh, all these meetings uh, with our uh, cell phone. And uh, we uh, used these, um, these meetings and made transcripts, uh, which uh, later uh, became uh, this performance uh, that we made that was called uh, They Live. Uh, and uh, the, also the, the important thing is that uh, during this um, show, the, during this performance, uh, uh, there was an uh, election campaign taking place. So in April, uh, there was a big election and uh, one of the parties, of course, won. And uh, we were, uh, we were tra trying to have this performance first performed at the Yugoslav Drama Theater. Uh, we were censored, and afterwards uh, we did it at Dom Omladine. Uh, so, uh, Milan, uh, what would you say about this project we did uh, almost 10 years ago? And uh, can you tell me what do you think of uh, what we wanted to do with this project? Uh, in what way did we want to show that all the parties are the same and without changing the system, we cannot uh, actually change anything and that uh, in a way, uh, parliamentary democracy functions is this in this way that you in a way vote for less evils whenever you vote. Yeah, I don't think we, even then we thought that all the parties are, are same or of course, I don't think that this is what you really mean, but it, just in this sense that uh, real change could not come from any any of these parties. And I think that's the big crisis of parliamentary democracy. You had few examples on the global political scene that, that from Greece and UK and a little bit from America that there, that we felt that something can be changed uh, through parliament parliamentary politics. But all of these uh, attempts failed uh, somehow uh, for different reasons or whatever. But in Serbia, in Serbia, things things were uh, different. I think uh, it was very much obvious that this is uh, the how do you say the politics that were happening at, at that time and especially today. It was uh, just like a different kind of uh, I don't know how to describe this kind of. Um, yeah, business, business politics. I mean, I'm not, I think even then we were not trying to somehow open the eyes of people because I think everybody knew that things were happening like this. I mean, uh, I don't think it's very, how do you say, shocking to say that uh, corruption exists or that, uh, how do you say that, uh, yeah, that you need to have some kind of political backing to get things done and so on, like, this the, everybody knew this but i think it was just i think we were shocked for the for the because everything went so easy i think for me personally this was the the biggest shock you know we went to a political party and since we are somehow successful in our field we were immediately offered to run theaters uh, to be directors of the theaters and stuff like this and it was so banal and so direct and obvious that i think this was the, been the biggest shock the second one the second how to say surprise for me uh was that this when we sent them uh, the goebbels text so I don't know if you mentioned it now in the introduction, but we uh, like we took one of Goebbels' text uh, uh, that was uh, called. Do you remember the name of the text? It was the speech for the members of the in, Nazi Party for from twenty eight or what? What was the? It year? was uh, knowledge and propaganda. Uh, it was the Goebbels' speech from uh, nineteen twenty eight. Yes. And I didn't mention it, actually. That was the, the next thing I wanted to mention. Yeah, I mean, we, so we took this text and we just changed the name, Hitler's name, to the name of, uh, of the president of a party and the uh, name of the Nazi party to the name of, of the party we sent it to. And we sent it to all the seven parties and they loved it everywhere, uh, which I think... <laughs> I mean, for, for me, this didn't mean that, of course, all the parties are like uh, have Nazi tendencies, but it, it t told us something about uh, how they say the somehow post-political or how do you say 
uh, the position of of the parties in Serbia that that politics is something that that is just has a much more to do with advertising than with some kind of concrete political ideas, which of course again is not a shocking new new fact, but everything was put out so op- direct and and blatant. Do you say in English that for me this was a big shock? Yes, and it was also interesting that. Uh, we uh, actually uh, took this text of uh, Goebbels and we uh, put uh, only uh, uh, on, we only changed the, the title of uh, of the text uh, in uh, in our uh, version it was called the uh, idea strategy movement uh, we also uh, uh, changed the uh, national socialism of course to democracy to socialism and whatever the other parties were and uh, we changed hitler to the name of the leader of the par- uh, leader of the parties and we sent it off to all the parties and it was uh, actually our thoughts uh, on uh, cultural politics and uh, marketing strategies we said it was our text and the uh, interesting uh, thing for me uh, if you remember that was that um, the liberal democratic party actually was the only one uh, that put this text uh, that was written by us uh, uh, on their website and it stayed on their website for I think seven eight days and they didn't realize that this was uh, Goebbels' text and this is like uh, at that time that was like the most uh, progressive party in uh, in Serbia which was very interesting uh, so did your uh, view on uh, generally uh, the way politics and, and political parties function uh, did it change when you uh, moved to Sweden? Uh, because you moved to Sweden a year after we did this performance, you actually um, had a chance to see how things function there. And you also now have a chance to live in another EU country, Slovenia, uh, which has its own problems, of course. So would you tell us something about uh, your position now and your position then? I mean, that's a huge question because, I mean, a lot of things changed. The, my view of, how do I say, parliamentary system didn't change so much. Uh, because, uh, okay, I was getting to know both of these countries. It took me some time to see, to just scratch on the surface of, of the situation of in Sweden and Slovenia. So, so I can't talk uh, as if I've been living there for a long time, but I lived in Sweden for almost five years and now in in Slovenia for a couple of years. Uh, So my view of political parties didn't change so much in the sense that parliamentary politics is in in crisis, I think, globally. Uh, But some other things changed. I did come to to Sweden with uh, pink glasses, as you say, I felt like, uh, especially Malmö, I liked a lot. I lived in Malmö. Uh, so I came there expecting uh, something. I think most people that I talk to have this view of Sweden as some kind of progressive place and so on, because of course there are a lot of fantastic things about Sweden, but my view changed there after a while. I mean, uh, it was, I think, for the first time in my life that my identity was, uh, you know, uh, imposed on me. I think this is something that people who are black or who are whatever, uh, like women or whatever, their identity that that look like women or whatever, their identity somehow uh, it comes from some kind of hegemonic position and it's it's uh, imposed on them. But this was completely unknown feeling for me being a, like a middle class man educated and so on uh, in Serbia this was an, a completely new feeling so I came there and I'm like I'm queer like uh, I don't know um, uh, I, I listen to this kind of music or whatever I'm uh, anarchist or whatever you know and then I come there and all of a sudden you know I'm a, all of a sudden like the identity of a cis man and uh, how to say like uh, Serbian, all of a sudden I was produced into a Serbian and so on. And this was a completely new feeling, you know, and the, together with the fact that I was really poor, that for, for a couple of years I was living from, I don't know, bi- stealing bicycles and collecting cans and like building stages for Diana and Pope. 
so all of the all this together was a really important experience for me because it changed the way I look at politics altogether, you know, especially identity politics. I, I became really suspicious to this. And we can talk on and on why I think this is a dead end. But um, I think more like if I had to put it to like to simplify it and put it short, it just it, it's the main position is something that is completely, um, how do you say, um, it's completely harmless to capitalism and to the system that we live in because first of all it produces differences which is which is something that capitalism or bourgeois civilization or society was doing from its beginnings that was the first you know if you read i don't know silvia federici or whatever you know you see that this is this was something that happened from the beginning and it's still going on you st- you, you need to make difference, differences that are more and more subtle, but more and more important, you know. When you go to a dating site in Sweden or whatever in, in West, you have so many subcategories that you get lost into them. And I don't know, like, what all of these things mean. And I don't even know if I like this. Thing. It's just so confusing. I don't know. So I think this is something that I, I became really aware of living in Sweden. But then living in Slovenia, it's a bit different. It's a bit, we, there is some kind of, there is some kind of uh, common history that Slovenia has with Serbia from Yugoslavia. And there is some, of course, socialist, uh, uh, how do you say, tradition or whatever, like history that, that, that makes it easier for me to, to how do you say, make, uh, communicate on some other level. You know, it's 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 a completely different topic. You know, when you talk, for example, about feminism in Sweden, what it is there, where I felt a lot like uh, uh, that. Uh, for example, that the I felt a lot that the like the final um, line of feminism in Sweden was the way I felt it was uh, uh, some kind of separatism. You know, autonomy, which is, I feel that is really. And nobody's asking me, of course, but like that I feel that this makes sense if it's a tactic that has certain length in time and then it, this the use of it is finished and then we can all be together after a while. But if this is the ultimate goal, is separatism and women-only spaces and so on, if this is the ultimate goal, then I think we missed something, I feel. you know. So, yeah. Yeah. This was my little rant about <laughs> my life in the last seven years, yes. And uh, I'm just going to go back to, uh, to our performance. Uh, actually, when we, we did the performance, uh, we, um, we of course, uh, got a lot of opinions from lots of people. Uh, and uh, some of them uh, asked us, uh, how come that we were so brave to do such a thing? Uh, and I remember, uh, and I quote that very often, that you said that uh, it's easy to be brave when you're a, a middle-class uh, artist uh, that has his own apartment and if doesn't have money, he can ask his uh, parents to give him pocket money or whatever. Uh, so um, can you tell me uh, how do you... Um, in a way, now uh, think about these uh, privileges you have. Do you uh, feel that you're privileged now, or uh, by not living in Serbia, uh, by having this different kind of uh, identity as a person that doesn't live in his country anymore, do you think that you lost these privileges, or do you still feel that even in another country you are in a way privileged to be? Uh, white middle class male how do you deal with these privileges do you think about them yeah, of course i'm privileged i think this is something that is good to be aware when you somehow try to make sense of the world around you i think this is really important and uh, it can tell you a lot about not only yourself but other people and the society you are in again living in sweden for me was extremely important because uh, all of the sudden, I was for the first time in my life. Okay, as a non-heterosexual in Serbian uh, Serbia, I was also non-privileged in some way. But this was not. This is not very obvious when you you see me in the street. You know, I never held hand with a boyfriend in that way, so I could get 
beaten up or whatever. But uh, mm, in Sweden, it was obvious I was a Juge, which is like a racist term for from the 90s for people from ex-Yugoslavia. So, it, uh, so I was... Uh, Somehow I felt this, that I was underprivileged in this way. And this was a, a, a new experience for me completely. A little bit similar situation you have, I have in, here in Slovenia, they have a, a term for cefuri, which is an interesting term. It's like a Turkish, I think, word for Jews, but they use it here for uh, foreigners from ex-Yugoslavia in Slovenia. But then again, of course, Serbian culture is very, how do you say, present in Slovenia. So it's the situation is not so clear. Uh, but this was very important uh, experience for me <clears throat> in both of these in both of these places. But uh, wait, there was something more. Again, uh, there was another part of your question. Can you say it again? You're muted. Yeah. I, I just realized. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I was uh, actually uh, thinking uh, um, about this thing when you said that. Um, do you think that you are a brave artist? I will be the, the direct. Uh, do you think of yourself as a brave artist? Do you think that what you do uh, with your art is in a way brave, or do you think that you're just uh, using sometimes? Uh, art as some kind of a tool to say things that you want to say about the world? Well, I have, I think I am privileged in the sense that I don't have to choose, you know, I mean, a lot, a many, I think every project that I do that I really care about, I am being uh, what I, the term I really love that I use with my uh, partner, Nina, uh, uh, I'm being suicidal. And I think this is really a good way <laughs> It's good to be suicidal. I think in many ways, I think in love, you have to be suicidal. No, I think in your politics, in and I also feel like this in, in my work, you need to be suicidal. But in this sense that that uh, you are somehow always start from, from, the, from nothing and you are ready to lose everything in the sense. But of course, I was never really hungry. You know, and, and in this sense, like I could, I was never in the position, like I completely understand. I mean, it would be very cynical for me to say like, okay, uh, for people who have no other way to make money, like, why are you not saying something to your boss or whatever, you know, for, I always say that the, like the biggest reason why I stayed in theater and I managed to make a career in theater was because I had a flat in Serbia. So I, I got a flat when i was soon after i finished the university so i my expenses my living expenses were really low so i could grow, go through a, a long periods of non not 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 working and i could say no to the projects that i didn't like and so on <clears throat> and then also in the projects that i did i could be a radical in a way <clears throat> but i don't think i'm brave in this sense because I think I'm just, uh, this is the way I, I, I want to do theater. If there was, you remember already when we finished university, when we met, like, not when we met, but when we started working in, Dra in uh, NADA, in Project NADA, in National Theater of Belgrade, uh, uh, that uh, I felt like if this didn't happen, that I wouldn't work in theater. And I think it's the same now. Like, if I could not do things the way I want to do them, I would just do something else. Because I think where I am privileged and where I am lucky is the fact that I know how to do a lot of different things. And I uh, honestly, I think I would be happy doing other things too. I just think that the ratio of amount of money that I'm making in theater uh, compared to the amount of work that I have to invest and also the happiness that the work itself is giving me, there is also a lot of grief that the work is giving me but this ratio is uh, at the moment uh, so that uh, it really makes sense for me to work in theater um, uh, and also i'm meeting i have to say this that i'm also meeting really interesting people coming back to our project you no know, uh, my current partner nina ramshak markovic i met when we performed uh, they live in slovenia in yeah, a great right, theater. Yeah. I met her there. Of course, we, we got together many years later. And uh, my 
current, um, how do you say, the closest associate director, Sebastian Horvat, I met in Zurich when we were touring with They Live. And he watched our performance there. And this was this was a beginning of the most important and, how do you say, creative um how to say relationship that i have in in theater so this i think this is really cool that i get to meet so many fantastic people uh yes and uh, also the thing that uh, you and i like to talk a lot about uh, uh, is the problems of uh, socially engaged theater uh, uh what kind of theater is actually socially engaged uh, because uh, I think this braveness issue that we've been talking about has to do also with the uh, with the term socially engaged theater. You have a lot of theater going on that uh, has a tendency to be engaged, but then you only see like these uh, pamphlets uh, that are in a way didactic that are telling you uh, what you want to do and stuff like that. And I know that you and your theater work have a, you have a different way of, uh, of dealing with, uh, with social issues. And you also have a different way of dealing with, uh, with dramatic theater at all, because I think you try to change it in a way. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, these processes you do and uh, what do you think about socially engaged theater at all? Well, I think it's a, it's, it's a market niche that is f very often for me extremely boring. I have to be honest. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely suspicious to it. I'm not, it's not that I don't think that uh, we should be engaged, that, that society should not be questioned. And of course, this is, I think, extremely the mo one of the most important things. But most of the time, uh, Maya, I have to say that I see two kinds of performances or art in, in this niche. And I don't know which one I dislike more. <laughs> one is... Uh, uh, let's say performances or art that is kind of preaching to the choir in the sense that is somehow reaffirming your identity as whatever and that it's what making fun of some other identity and then you just feel good and you it's some kind of feel good stuff that I don't like at all and the other one I hate even more and that one is just used to produce guilt and I think this is not only boring, I think this is extremely dangerous because me coming from a, a um, history of drug abuse and, and uh, being treated for drug abuse, I've, I've, uh, I've been thinking and working a lot on the, on the uh, feeling of guilt and the politics of guilt. And I know that nothing good comes from it, you know, because uh, you know what I'm talking about. No, it's this performance is that you go there you see that somebody's suffering, immigrants, women, some kind of minorities in society and so on. You cry for their destiny and then you go out from the theater feeling that you've done actually something. And it's this Aristotel Aristotelian feeling that I think is completely counterproductive and boring in a way, you know, because it makes you do the work in the theater and so you are relieved from doing any work when you leave the theater. Of course, there is the, this, let's say, third kind of performances or art that I really like. And it's this kind of, I don't care really what happens inside the, the theater building. It can be done in many different ways. I just, I'm just interested in what is the concrete impact on society, not on me, on my identity. I would really love something to fuck up my identity, to fuck up my feeling of what I am, what does it mean to be a man or woman or a leftist or whatever? So this gets destroyed, questioned or whatever. And also, so when you go out of the theater, then the real work starts. Also, I really like the performances that uh, makes you uh, realize that you as audience are not one homogenic group that there is a difference between me and my neighbor, that, that some things I agree about, some things we don't agree about. So there, so there can be a discussion afterwards. And I really love these uh, performances that steer up the situation in the sense that 
um, that makes you talk about things and discuss things and question things. And this is rare. This is the problem. There is, so, especially in the West, my feeling, I don't know a lot about theater in the West, don't get me wrong, but, uh, or theater at, in general. <laughs> but my experience of it is that, that this happens extremely uh, rare, rare and uh, mostly it's outside of the realm of politically engaged theater, whatever that is. Uh, yes, and um, also uh, an interesting thing with our performance was that uh, when we uh, traveled with it, because actually we were after uh, it was uh, performed in Serbia, we were um, uh, first, uh, I remember that when we performed it the first time, that you said that we will never perform it again. Do you remember? Because you said that for you, the performance was uh, theater and the project, uh, the real thing was the three months while we were in the party. So uh, that, that, that was the thing where you wanted to say that uh, this is theater and this is like a close pro project that we have now. We will do it once and never again. And then when we were discussing afterwards, uh, because uh, we were actually, we uh, got this uh, invitation uh, to have a, a post-production of the, of the show, because the show was done completely for free. We didn't have any kind of funding. Uh, so this uh, organization uh, called Maska from uh, Slovenia actually uh, told us that they would uh, try to send us to uh, different festivals in Europe. And we said, yeah, well, why not? But uh, you said that uh, the only way that we would perform this again is uh, by re-articulating every performance we do in the social context where we do the performance. So we had like interesting uh, interventions. Uh, we did a uh, performance in Slovenia, in Switzerland. I love the one in Switzerland, uh, in Sweden, in Norway. And every time that we went to another place, we would make like some kind of a rearticulation because we didn't want uh, it to be like a final project. Like, okay, see this corruption and this kind of government only exists in Serbia and nowhere else. We wanted to show that this is a thing that's an issue that concerns uh, the rest of the world, uh, not, not just us, not just the crazy people from the Balkans. Uh, so uh, can you tell me something about this? What do you think about this? Yes, I mean, I, 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 I agree and I think for many different reasons. Uh, one of them, of course, is that I felt that we can earn some money from this project and we did earn a couple of hundreds of euros. It was really nice. But I think also the way we did, the way we did it, uh, uh, this of kind of rethinking, rearticulation of the whole thing it has to do with this attempt to do critical art. I, fe I feel that somehow um, the moment, if if we kept just performing the same show when we made a uh, European tour, I felt that it would only somehow for most of the audience, the effect, the only possible effect that the performance would offer would be to reaffirm somehow the belief in, uh, how do you say, in their identity and in their political system. Of course, even if they're thinking people, they would not get much more from the performance. So. Also, when we performed uh, in the, because after being censored in Euro Yugoslav Drama Theater, then we were somehow invited to, to perform on the, in the biggest festival in our region, like in XU region, this Bita Festival. Uh, uh, it was a great honor, but we decided, of course, to somehow, I can say trick, uh, uh, people who invited us to, to, to perform there and to change the performance. So when we were offered, we were asked, where do we want to perform? And we said, first, we want to perform in uh, Yugoslav Drama, Drama Theater, the theater that censored us. And the second, if they say no, we want to perform in the city parliament. And uh, uh, in the end, it happened that both of these places said yes. So we had two performances, one after another. They were different in 
different ways. Uh, but for me, the most favorite performance was the one in the city parliament where we were uh, somehow the topic of the performance was our city mayor. So we had the opportunity to criticize in the big international festival performing in the city parliament. All of the sudden, we had the opportunity to, to criticize our mayor, who was at that time uh, uh, Dragon Gilas. I was angry at him most of all, apart from his, uh, how do you say, his, uh, 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 how do you say, uh, gray area in the uh, gray stuff he did in the business area. I was most uh, mostly angry of him uh, at him for for the things he did for for Romas, because during his uh, rule, a lot of Roma uh, villages. Uh, were cleaned, or how do you say these people were evicted in a horrible way, and so on. So, so this was for me. This was the uh, something I loved about this project: the fact that we not only had the chance, but somehow we we always had to to play chess with the with the context in a way. So, you know, yes, it was also interesting if you remember that the uh, director of the Beta Festival, Jovan Chirilov. Uh, uh, told us uh, after this performance we did, they were not happy about it because they wanted this performance that they saw. And when they got another one, which was completely different, and of course it was criticizing the mayor in the parliament building, uh, which was a complete guerrilla, and he told us, how could you do this? He gave us money for the festival. And then I remember you told him, this is not his money, it's our money, it's the money of taxpayers. Uh, so what do you think about this kind of looking at funding of arts, like uh, the person that is giving you money, like he's giving you his money, so now you cannot criticize him because he's giving you like this from his pocket, and of course it's not from his pocket, it's from our pockets. No, I love this question because, you know, you have a lot of, a lot of times from coming from the people from the left, you know, you have this position that you should not take the money because money is somehow corrupting you and so on. I'm always for taking money. I love money. I think you should always take money, you know, but I think you should never be loyal. But I think you should never be loyal somehow to people who are giving you money. You should never be loyal to people who are not giving you money. You should not be loyal to yourself. You know, I think this is the for me the, the core of the politics that I believe in. So take money and then stab them in the back when you get the money, to quote Zizek. No? So. Okay, so uh, I think this is a good moment uh, for us to watch uh, an insert from the movie that was actually uh, an inspiration for our project, uh, in a way. Well, uh, we gave the same title to our project as the movie They Live by John uh, Carpenter from 1988. So first uh, we can see the clip, uh, maybe some people forgot it or haven't seen it, and then we can talk a little bit about that.
What's your problem? What's your problem, Milan? No, I love this. You know, if this was sold as a critical, uh, uh, socially engaged uh, movie, I think that would suck. I think it's great that it's just a silly sci-fi. Then it works. Uh, uh, Oops. Are we losing Maya? Okay, I don't know if this is on my end or Maya, so I'm just going to keep talking about the movie in case it's Maya. Do you hear me now? I hear you. Yep. Yep. Okay, uh, my question is because you were the one that, uh, it's my end, uh, you were the one uh, that gave uh, this title to our uh, performance, so uh, yeah, wh why, why was that? What do you want? Well, of course I know, but the audience doesn't know. And Okay. So, so um, I'm just going to answer the, the half of the question that I heard. Uh, so uh, the, they live, the, the reason I proposed this, this name was because um, I wanted to somehow, uh, I mean, something that we both wanted, but I think this is something that's made it a bit more clear. I wanted to emphasize the ideological uh, part of the, of, of the material we had, I mean, in the not ideological, in the sense, the the, the, crit, the critique of ideology, I think we wanted to put this somehow as something a bit more obvious. So it's not that we are somehow looking for morals in that that morals are, are missing. Uh, I mean, in some sense, I would love to have less morals in the in politics, uh, <clears throat> but so we didn't want to have this as uh, the main thing in the sense that. Uh, that some people who are less qualified are getting positions and people are somehow there is corruption in political parties this was not the only thing that was uh, or the main thing that was the problem you know the, we wanted to somehow also play with i mean to somehow um talk about the fact that the system itself is corrupt and uh, just to make it a little bit more uh, pre present in in the show and if I would talk a little bit more about this, this is something that when I, I watched the, the performance now for the first time in, I don't know, 10 years or seven, eight years. And for me, this was the, the biggest critique I would have of it watching it today. Uh, the fact that uh, somehow a couple of things, one, one of them is... Uh, I'm thinking of a lot about the politics of affect. So in the sense, uh, what kind of affect does this performance produce? And I think it's very, there's a lot of sentimental, sad moments in the show, which I think communicate very well with our audience, which is, you know, middle class, uh, liberal left and so on. And I think this worked really well with them. But I'm also thinking uh, if, if this was, if we talked a little bit more about one of our goals for doing this performance, having also this title in in mind, I think maybe we would also try to talk to some other kind of audience in some other way. You know, I think with this audience, the most important things are moral. I keep talking with my father, whom I love a lot, and he's one of the closest people I have in my life. But he keeps waiting for this honest guy who is going to appear in the parliamental swamp that we live in. And I think most of our audience had the same sentiment. 
And I think this would be my biggest critique of our show because we played into this sentiment of, you know, some there is a lot of crooked people in the politics. If we get rid of the, what's the name of the American movie? All the Amer presidents' men. What's what's presidents? Yeah. yeah. If we get yeah. rid of this corruption really high, then the system would work. No. Yes, well, uh, the interesting uh, thing about the movie, because we also used these glasses uh, during our performance, it was like a little homage. Uh, we had the glasses on while we were performing. Uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, actually the main character, John Nada, uh, he finds these glasses, which when you put on, you can see the world black and white as it is. Uh, he finds it in an abandoned church where uh, uh, where the uh, you also have a priest that is blind, which is also a very interesting symbol. And uh, also uh, th there is a little uh, a lot of um, treating of religion in the movie, interesting treating of religion. Uh, when he looks at the banknotes and it says, this is our God. So you have like the money, of course, being being the God. But then you have the, church actually the abandoned church being the place where you find the glasses that make you see the real world so how do you define this abandoned church uh... yeah i think there is a like it has to do with of course i think with ideology you know i think this has a lot to do i mean zizek is writing and and, and talking a lot about this but you have this kind of uh, the kind of ideologies that are very much in your face. You know, if you're a Christian, you're going to put it around your neck and have a little cross there or whatever. If you are a, a fascist or a communist, you're going to have it on your wall or whatever. But, you know, what if you're whatever? First of all, if you're a liberal person, what do you put or how do you deal with it? There is some kind of feeling that, you know, with hipsters, no hip, like you define a hipster by saying, by people who say I'm not a hipster, he is the hipster, I'm not the one. So it feels a little bit today <laughs> that the things are the other way around. And also, uh, you know, I grew up, I think what I loved, you just mentioned it, I really love this that he's called Nada in the way that he's nobody or he's nothing, he's, he has no ideology. He's not our hero in this movie is not an, an activist, you know, fuck activists. I don't like activists in this sense when it becomes an identity. He's not a communist, he's not a feminist, whatever. He is nobody. And I love it because also, you know, you're coming from theater. <clears throat> it's, I think, another, another way to look at everybody, you know, the every man, you know, the, the way it was popular a couple of hundreds of years ago <clears throat> in theater, in playwright, in playwriting. So I think this is another way to, to talk about a person who is what Zizek calls a pure subject in the sense that it, I think it played in tune with what I talked about, what happened to me uh, uh, realizing uh, the way I, uh, um, <clears throat> sorry, the way I saw myself moving from Serbia to Sweden. You know, in Serbia, I had all the, uh, you know, I, I felt that I'm the citizen of the world, you know, I listen to punk. I'm an anarchist. You know, I know all the proper books. I'm, you know, I have this cool identity that I felt that would, that I, that could communicate with the world. I felt like, you know, and then when I moved to Sweden, all of a sudden my identity was imposed on me and me by accepting this imposed identity, all of a sudden I felt that this is the moment when I reach universality. I know I don't know if this makes any sense, but I felt that this is I, I, I felt much more a citizen of the world when I felt when I was in Sweden than when I than, than what I was fantasizing about my identity when I was in Belgrade, being this cool kid that knows all the the yeah. bands that are popular in the world, you know. Yeah. Yes, I, I completely understand what you're talking about, and also what. Um, uh, concerning the the ideology and seeing the world uh, black and white, which it's supposed to be actually uh, uh, by the movie, when you put the glasses on, the world is actually black and white. And when you take it off and you see this world that the evil aliens in the movie made for us, the evil surveillance aliens, 
uh, he did anticipate in a way the surveillance state actually. Uh, and then it's color, they colored the world. They ma made it colorful. And I was thinking, what would the glasses be today? And then I was thinking about the VR headset sets that we put on. Uh, if we would say that without the VR headset, we think we are living in a complete normal reality. But with putting the VR headset on, we are actually seeing that we live in a simulation. Yeah, this is an interesting position because, of course, first thing that comes into my mind, you know, you see the world that is already virtual, already the, the world we live in is a construct, and then you put something that is constructed a little bit less perfectly, and this is not going to give you any truth. But in a funny way, maybe you're right because it makes you just maybe we could say that that this could be a fun exercise to somehow see the uh, see the uh, if you have this kind of pleonasm that you have a virtuality of the virtual world that this could make it a little bit more transparent in a way. But I, altogether, I'm 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 suspicious to to any kind of technological solution because I don't think it ever worked. I always uh, like to read about the way people reacted uh, or like the fantasies that people have with the first industrial revolution and now when the robots are working for us and so on. I mean, <laughs> you get these new machines that, that, you, that allow you to work less and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, of course, everything that, the only thing that is happening is that uh, it's much easier to produce surplus value without people. And, you know, uh, this is the thing that when you watch this movie, I have a couple of I watched it again now for preparing for this. I watched also the movie. And one of my first uh, feelings that I was shocked by the, the tempo of the movie. It's so beautifully slow. I felt like, oh, I mean, I could really relax. And, he, you know, they could allow themselves to have like uh, an introduction and development and character, the, all of these things that you don't have in sci-fi movie, movies today. And, and this was so nice that you also have time to paint a little bit the social climate of the day and so on and so on. This was the first thing. And then the second thing about, which is also tells us something about the world we live today, how how naive in a way, or like somehow it was a dystopian movie, of course. It's a movie about the bad view of the world. But this bad is not so bad, you know. When you look, there is, there is a moment in the movie when, when there is a, 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 a how you can say, a this one, a lot of police is coming to attack uh, these people. Um, uh, but this, you, if you compare this, cops to the police with this militarized police we have today that's nothing if you complain if you compare the surveillance they have in the movie to what we have today it's also nothing i mean it, all of these things i think the this is not even the, the world we live in is not even some kind of bad dystopia from the 90s i think this is uh, this is much much worse and the problem is that we are getting you know cooked like the frogs you know, in the experiment very slowly and things are getting normalized super fast. This is the surprising thing, you know. People get shocked. I mean, not people, of course, all of us got shocked with this corona crisis that we live, that we're living in and so on. But I feel that it's, it's not so surprising. I, okay, we, I grew up in Serbia and there was a one shit after another. So, okay, maybe we are not a representative in that sense. But... <clears throat> I don't feel this is a big difference than the way things were before Corona. I think things are just went a little bit faster, but I think this is the way it's going to continue if we don't change things. Uh, there, there is going to be some periods of calm and then a big change, but always in the same direction. You know, whatever happens next, the next uh, uh, medical crisis or climate crisis or whatever comes next, it's, uh, we cannot be surprised, I think. We don't You're have the luxury to be surprised. In a way. Sorry? You're a pessimist in a way. I'm not a pessimist. I mean, I'm a happy person. I have, I'm lucky enough to, to be able to be happy. But, uh, you know, the science, are, I mean, you, you read the, the papers, you know what is happening. 
There is not a lot of different ways things can develop if we continue the way things are. It's just going to be, uh, yeah, more and more crisis like this. Yep. Yeah. So then uh, the end of the movie where the John Nada, John Nobody destroys the signal and now everybody can see that uh, evil aliens are uh, ruling the world. We today know that evil aliens are ruling the world and in a way we have this uh, evidence of uh, surveillance and uh, uh, terrible things that are happening to us uh, all around and of course the corona crisis so um what would be your view of the world in the next couple of years what do you think uh, art will look like what do you think your life will look like yes i don't know enough about art to make any kind of uh how to say to have any kind of ideas that i could share about this but I'm a, I'm really a pessimist when it comes to this because this is maybe the 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 most naive part of the movie, no? Because he our hero destroys the the center of uh, of propaganda, you know, and then everything is is fine. We know the world. You wake up from the dream, and all of a sudden you wake up from the ideology, and all of a sudden you see your neighbor the way he is, and you see the robot the way he is. I think. Why I am so pessimistic is because we, I think we have gone through a fundamental change uh, in what it means to be human. I think we changed in a way that that doesn't allow us to do this. Of course, I still have, I'm not a pessimist in the way that think that, you know, our civilization is doomed and it should be destroyed. You know, still I think that our reflex is to be with together with one another. I still remember the crisis in Argentina where, where people's reflex was to organize in um, neighborhood, uh, how to say, these communities and to uh, uh, take over the factories and so on. I think there is some kind of reflex to be together. I just think the, think the way things are at the moment, I think that it's not as easy as to open the eyes to people because we are not people anymore <laughs> in the way we were, you know. Things have changed. I think our souls, if we had souls, I think, I think our souls uh, are changed in this, in this way. So, uh, yeah, I think... Um, it has, I think what we should be learning all the time is finding new ways to be together. You know, I'm not saying get off Facebook, get off Instagram. I don't care about these things. And I don't think, I think it's a privilege if you can live without these things. I think more and more, this is a necessity. Uh, uh, if you want to work, if you want to stay in touch with your family, whatever, I understand that people have to be there, but it's just that uh, this has an effect on how we, communicate how how we love how we perceive politics all of these things and this changed us i think we should be honest about this yes well i would finish with this um thought, milan thank you very much for being my first guest and uh, i would also uh, want to tell the audience that uh, in the description below they have links if they want to see the show they have the complete show with english subtitles also uh, milan's uh, website uh, to see his work uh, and some other things uh, and uh, now um, before we say bye to milan uh, i will just tell you that we will be after this uh, watching um, a 10 or 13 minute uh, slideshow from our performance, uh, which you can watch or not, uh, but it will be playing. And so, yes, um, thanks Milan for being here. Thank you, Ma. It was a, a pleasure and an honor to be your first guest. <laughs> thanks. Oh.